once around the beehive cluster, an interesting little open cluster in the rather obscure constellation of Cancer the Crab. I say obscure because it's quite hard to find Cancer. There aren't really any bright stars in it. So it's the uh, gap between Leo and uh, Gemini. But the Beehive Cluster is classified as M44, and it's right in the centre. Ptolemy described it as a small cloud in the heart of the crab. Um, I guess he had very much better skies than we do. So you can find this with a pair of binoculars very easily. It's best viewed with a small telescope. And, uh, of course, Galileo was the first to turn the telescope to the sky, and this was one of the first objects that he inspected with it. It's number 44 in Charles Messier's catalogue of annoying things that were not comets, and it's pretty obviously not a comet. So, in fact, he probably put this and a few of the other objects in the catalog just to beef it up a bit uh, because he wanted to have more objects in his catalog than some of the uh, rivals of the time had i think there was a, a few people who had about around about 40 objects and so he went a lot further all the way up to about 100 in order to try and have the best catalog and on the right there there's a little map that was drawn by william sure uh, in 1894 trying to very precisely map out where the stars in the beehive cluster are. It's about 610 light years away from us, measuring the distance. These things always a certain amount of variability. So it depends which catalog you look in as to exactly what number you get. Um, and we think that there are around about a thousand stars in this group, adding up to just about 600 times the mass of our sun it's been around for 650 million years or so plus or minus 50 and uh, when we do a count uh, of the stars that are present two-thirds of them are red dwarf stars 30 percent of them are the sun-like stars the late k orange stars g stars and f stars um, and just two percent tip over into the slightly more massive a types category and there are none that are more massive than about two solar masses in the entire cluster and that makes sense because big stars live fast and die young if you have the uh, a range of stars made in a cluster you'll get little ones through to very large giants so smallest red dwarfs orange dwarfs sun-like stars, white stars, and then the blue hot stars at the most massive end of things. But they might be more massive, but they burn their fuel at a prodigious rate. And so round about a million years after the most massive stars are born, they blow up as a supernova at the end of their life. 10 million years for the next rank down. So each step on the horizontal axis is a factor of 10 here. So 1 million in the top row, 10 million in the second row, 100 million in the third row for the, uh, the white stars, roughly. And then we have the yellowy white, yellow and red ones that live a billion, 10 billion, 100 billion or even a trillion years. And so with an age of 650 million for the cluster, only the stars that are less than about double the mass of the sun are still around all of those larger ones so there are a few of the less massive white ones around but uh, the majority of the white ones and all of the blue and uh, supergiant stars have exploded and died already and you can see that when you do a survey of the cluster and you look at the diagram of temperature of stars versus their luminosity the so-called hertzsprung russell hr diagram and what you find is that rather than having a complete mixture because all the stars were born at the same time you have only those up to the turnoff point still present on the main sequence diagonal and the larger more massive stars than that have already evolved 
off the main sequence, becoming giant stars as they run out of nuclear fuel in their cores and start going through the phases of converting heavier elements. And in fact, in the Beehive Cluster, anything over about eight times the mass of the sun exploded long ago as a supernova. Um, those guys would only live for uh, 100 million years or so. And the smaller ones will have shed their atmospheres and become white dwarfs. And in fact, when we look in the cluster, what we find is just five of the thousand stars are presently in the red giant phase for uh, K class, K zero stars. So the hot end of the orange stars and one that is a yellow giant, a G zero star. And then we have 11 white dwarfs that have been located. Now, there might be more of these that we haven't found yet, but uh, those have all come from the more massive B-type stars um, and some of the hotter A stars that have evolved right through and become white dwarfs now. Um, of course, the O-class stars and the hotter end of the B stars will probably have exploded as supernovae rather than leaving these things behind. And so we might find a few neutron stars there, but so far none have been discovered. Now, what's interesting about these open clusters is that they sort their stars by mass. The process called mass segregation occurs. What happens is that as all the stars are orbiting around the center of mass, they chaotically encounter each other and have flybys and when they have a flyby they swap momentum and energy between them and this process tends to lead to an equalization of the energy um, and the consequence of that is that the massive stars tend to sink in towards the center and the small stars are hurled out towards the edge and you can see that in this picture of this cluster where all the big bright stars are in the middle and all the faint ones are uh, emanating around to the outside there. And of course, the reason for this is this equipartition rule uh, for energy. When you have interactions, you tend to end up with an even spread of energy and uh, kinetic energy, a half mv squared, is essentially the temperature of the system. And I don't mean how hot the stars are, I mean, the uh, kinetic energy can be equated to a, an overall system temperature in the same way that molecules moving around in a gas have uh, a temperature, which is the average kinetic energy of all of the molecules. And so what happens is that this equalizes through the cluster. But of course, given that the formula is a half the mass times the square of the velocity, if you have a large mass, then you have a lower velocity so that the total kinetic energy remains constant. And a low velocity, by the virtue of Kepler's laws of planetary motion, gives you a small orbit, whereas smaller mass stars require a higher velocity to end up with the same kinetic energy, and they end up in longer orbits. And so on average, they spend most of their time in the outer part of the, uh, the cluster. And the smallest objects of all might end up with such a high velocity that they are above the escape velocity of the overall gravity of the system. And they end up not in a elliptical orbit, but in a hyperbolic orbit and are hurled out of the cluster entirely. And in fact, these clusters do boil away over time. The uh, stars are thrown out of them until the cluster dissipates. And we can certainly see that, we think, in that we can't find any brown dwarf stars wandering around in orbits inside the beehive cluster. These stars would be smaller objects than even the small red dwarf stars getting down towards the size of a free-floating giant planet. And of course, for these much lighter weight characters, they need to have a much higher velocity in order to have the same average kinetic energy. And so they tend to pick up escape velocity and get kicked out. And so that's interesting because it means that open clusters probably 
form quite a lot of these brown dwarf stars and free-floating giant planets, but they all lose them very rapidly. And so there should be a lot of them wandering around the galaxy. What about planets themselves that are still bound to their stars? Well, in 2012, a couple of uh, planets were found orbiting stars. It was some excitement because these were sun-like stars, and this was quite early for the discovery of planets around sun-like stars. Um, but these were shown to be hot Jupiters, so they were giant planets orbiting very close to their stars. And, of course, um, uh, there's a video that I did about hot Jupiters. Um, this makes them easy to detect, so it's no surprise that we should be finding them first. But subsequently, with improving technology, we've managed to find nine more planets around the members of this cluster, and so they're probably everywhere. And uh, once we have better instruments to inspect all these stars, we're going to find that they've all got planets. Um, that seems to be the, the way of things and the result from the various surveys that have been done. And just to end up with, the other interesting thing about the Beehive Cluster, Prasipi, is that it sits roughly on the ecliptic plane so the path that the sun and the planets take through the sky as they go around passes through or very close to the beehive cluster. And this is the planet Mars here passing by the cluster. And it, uh, indeed, several of the other planets have been spotted going right across the face of it, which makes for a nice photograph. And indeed, here's another one where we've got a comet, Comet C 2001 Q4 passing the uh, beehive. So I just thought I'd end with those. So I hope you've enjoyed your little trip around the beehive cluster. And thanks very much for listening.